introduce our speaker today is the chair of our, of our Alzheimer's Dementia Initiative for the club, Janet Beardsley. Boulder Rotary Club launched a new Alzheimer's Dementia Initiative this year. We have formed a great team of Rotarians with knowledge and experience of Alzheimer's disease. We have been working behind the scenes on this initiative for the past several months. Our goal in our first year is to develop a plan for how Boulder Rotary can best fight this disease. Our areas of interest include public education about Alzheimer's and dementia, addressing the shortage of caregivers for Alzheimer's victims, and providing support and assistance to families dealing with the misfortune of this disease. Today's program marks the public debut of Boulder Rotary's Alzheimer's Dementia Initiative, as we believe that our entire community can learn about the societal, family, and individual challenges facing this rapidly growing population of people afflicted with Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. Dr. Tom Blumenthal came to our initial meeting of our team in September as a volunteer consultant and expert who shared his knowledge and experience with us. We were so impressed that we invited Tom to return and speak to the entire club. You are in for a treat today because Tom is not only a brilliant scientist, but he's also a guy with a wonderful sense of humor and a very easygoing manner. I introduce to you to Tom Blumenthal. Thank you, Janet. And thanks, everybody, for coming and for being here for this talk. Uh, it, I, it's a shorter talk, a shorter period of time than I've had before when I've given a uh, talk on this related subject. So, um, but anyway, I'd love it if you interrupted me with questions. Uh, you can save them to the end if you want to, but I think it helps everybody when someone asks a question. So there are people with microphones around, and if you raise your hand, they'll bring you a microphone, and I will do my best to answer whatever question you have. So I titled this talk, Alzheimer's Fact and Fiction, and then found out I only have half an hour. So I'm not gonna get to much fiction. But this is a science talk, I may use words that you don't know, and if you do, raise your hand, and I'll uh, try to define them. I try not to do that. I try to communicate with people rather than just stand up and talk in front of them. Now, let's see. I should be able to do this. Yeah, here's what I'm gonna cover today. <clears throat> For, first of all, characteristics of Alzheimer's disease, the physical changes that are occurring in the brain, the symptoms that accompany those physical changes, uh, and then I'll spend almost all the time on the molecular changes underlying the symptoms. Then I'll talk a little bit about exercise, and then f uh, finish by talking about finding a treatment, which has proved very difficult indeed. So the, the first thing that happens, I have to sort of look at this one while well, you look at that one, <clears throat> is, that the brain shrinks and you can see on one side of this a healthy brain and then the other side an advanced Alzheimer's brain and you can see it's much smaller, uh, it has bigger ventricles, those are the holes in the brain, um, the, the cortex is shriveled up uh, especially near the hippocampus which is the seat of learning and memory um, and just sort of the brain is shrinking because the cells are dying and as the cells die the brain gets smaller. And the key issue isn't that the brain is smaller. The key issue 
is that the cells have died. And if the nerve cells have died, then the brain doesn't function the way it used to. Yes? I've got a question. So, oh, that's a lot. Um, my grandpa uh, had, had a dementia, but he wasn't diagnosed with Alzheimer's per se. What is the difference between like Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia? That, that may have been a diagnostic issue, and it may have been that he had a different form of dementia. So, so uh, many things can cause dementia other than what I'm talking about today. But by far the most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's, which is what I am talking about today. But a, a lot of times, Alzheimer's doesn't get diagnosed as Alzheimer's, even though it is. Um, so, uh, in this picture, you can see on one side, which side? The left side, healthy nerves. They have lots of branches that connect with other nerves. And what happens in Alzheimer's is that you get the much more sparse, so some nerves are disappearing. Uh, and that's because they've died. And you get withered cell connections so that the cells don't uh, talk to each other, uh, which may mean that you don't talk to other people. Um, and then you can see also in this picture um, amyloid plaques. There, that's a plaque. And I'm going to spend most of the time today talking about plaques. And then the other thing that you can see here is tangles. So these are tangles. The plaques are outside the nerve cells, and the tangles are inside the nerve cells. Both of them are related in a way I will describe today to the onset of symptoms. So you have plaques and tangles, as I just said. And then you also often have uh, vascular changes in the brain, blood vessels changes, and then widespread inflammation. And we're starting to learn something more now about the importance of the widespread in inflammation. And I won't get to that until the end of the talk today. So there are many symptoms. It begins usually with gradual memory loss. And when I say gradual, I mean it the loss of memory gets worse and worse over the course, usually of many years. So it's slow, especially short-term memory. You often can retain long-term memories all the way through the disease, but short-term memories are very difficult. And you'll find people with Alzheimer's who will tell you something, and then two minutes later, they won't remember they've told you that already, and they'll tell it to you again which is why a lot of people with Alzheimer's just shut up, because somebody says to them, you just told me that. And then they, next time they don't say anything. Uh, and then later, after the memory problems develop, um, cognitive changes occur, ability to what's called executive function, ability to think as well um, diminishes. That happens later usually. And then there are a variety of behavioral symptoms that some people with Alzheimer's get and some don't. So none of these are more frequent than about three quarters of people with Alzheimer's. So you can't expect to get all of these if you get Alzheimer's, but you might well get some of these problems. And uh, I'm not an expert on this, but um, these things develop in some people only. Um, so I'm now going to switch to talking about the molecular changes that occur in Alzheimer's. It's largely a genetic disease. It often runs in families. Uh, several genes that can cause it have been identified. There's at least one gene that I will talk about uh, in a little while that increases the chances of getting it, but doesn't cause it in all people who have it. So I'm talking about genes, but Alzheimer's is caused by proteins. What's the relationship between genes and proteins? Um, th this is the central dogma in red here at the bottom. The genes are, the DNA, are composed of DNA. They're on chromosomes, and I will talk a little about chromosomes later. 
they are read into messenger RNA, RNA, and then the messenger RNA is read to protein. I have a slide on this. So think of genes as a book. Uh, the DNA is the book that contains the information. It doesn't do anything. It creates the symptoms uh, by changing the proteins. The symptoms are sometimes called phenotypes or characteristics. DNA doesn't do anything. The genes get read. They contain the code responsible for creating the proteins that almost everything, that does every, almost everything in our bodies, not everything. Genetic diseases result from mistakes, mutations in genes. And they result in altered proteins because the genes code for the proteins. The proteins made from several genes on several different chromosomes of our bodies um, have been identified as uh, responsible for Alzheimer's. And this lists a few of them. And I will talk about all of these a little bit. This is at the bottom of this slide. So this is the first one. It's called the amyloid cascade. The main protein that's part of plaque, that is that constitutes plaque, is called A-beta, or A-beta-42. It's a very short peptide that is cut out of a protein. The protein is called APP for amyloid precursor protein. And it's cut by a couple of enzymes, which are also proteins, into pieces. And A-beta is one of those pieces. And that wouldn't be a problem, except that A-beta has a tendency to form long fibers. So one A-beta binds to another A-beta, binds to another A-beta, and you can make a long fiber. Those fibers form plaque. So that's how plaque is formed. APP is cut up by secretases, making soluble A-beta that binds to itself, forming amyloid or plaque. Tau uh, is the tangle protein. So that's a different protein that forms tangles inside of nerve cells. Alzheimer's chemically changes tau such that it twists into these tangles. So this shows the modern imaging of uh, A-beta in this case. So it used to be said that you couldn't diagnose Alzheimer's until the patient is dead and you could look at their brain. Now you can look at their brain before they die. And the way you do that is PET imaging, pe uh, PET scanning. So this is uh, done with a fluorescent molecule that binds to, uh, in this case, plaque. And you can see plaque by putting the patient in a PET scanning machine. And what you see is this. So a, a normal brain will look like this. It's all uh, blue in this image because it hasn't taken up the floor. The floor has passed right through. It hasn't taken up the floor because it doesn't have plaque. But this is a, as an Alzheimer's brain, and you can see the bright yellows and reds, and that's because it has taken up the floor, and it shows it on a PET scan. So now you can diagnose uh, using this floor called PIB, which stands for Pittsburgh compound. It's where it was developed, the University of Pittsburgh or fluor beta peer. And then there's also one now for tau. So you can see both uh, while the patient is alive. And you can diagnose it. But it, it, it's not cheap. Uh, it's expensive, PET scanning. So now let's talk about correlating pathology with dementia. So the, this is a, a representation of what happens over time in a, the Alzheimer's brain. Uh, and this time is measured in years, as I said before. And this shows, this first line shows um, A-beta plaques coming up 
uh, over the years. And you can see as it goes up in this image, you can see um, that at it's preclinical here, and then you go into a period of time when plaque is going up, but there's hardly any change in the person who's experiencing this, and you don't know it's happening. So you get, this is called mild cognitive impairment, which gradually changes into full-blown Alzheimer's disease uh, later. And what I wanna show in this diagram is the timing of, the, of three of the events that occur. Much later, after A-beta, tau starts to go up. And, this, and you get these tangles uh, in the brain and the, and the brain cells are dying. So then you have fewer and fewer brain cells as tau goes up. So the point of this slide, the main point of this slide is A-beta or, or plaque goes up 20 years before um, the tangles that kill the cells and the nerve cells dying. So it doesn't match the timing. And yet, it's responsible. Good idea. Thank you. You want me to start over? No. So, so I'm finding it a kind of difficult figuring out the two things because I've got a pointer that has to go to that one and I have to read that one and it's tricky. <laughs> anyway, um, so the, the, the A-beta plaque correlates with the Alzheimer's. People with the, the subsequent memory loss have this accumulation of A-beta plaque but the timing doesn't correlate. Uh, so does that mean it isn't the cause? In fact, there are strong genetics that prove that A-beta is the cause. And I, I just want to go over some of that really quickly. A-beta is cut from the APP protein, as I told you earlier. Families with mutations in the APP gene exist, and some of them increase Alzheimer's, and some of them decrease Alzheimer's. So that's genetic proof that these proteins that cut APP into A-beta is res are um, res partly least responsible for Alzheimer's. And then there's other families with mu mutations in the secretase genes that cut A-beta out of APP. So you have both, the, the, the target and the cutter are both mutated sometimes in families. Um, and then here's, an, it, this is how I got into this, by the way, in case you're wondering why am I talking about this, because I've had a whole life working on other stuff. But uh, I became head of the Linda Cernick Institute for Down Syndrome um, about a dozen years ago. In fact, I was the first head of it in, at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. And we were, uh, associated with the Alzheimer's Research Institute that was starting up at the same time, and we shared a space. And that was because um, of what's on this slide. So everyone with Down syndrome, if they get old enough, gets Alzheimer's. Everyone. It's, it's the one group of people we know that are going to get Alzheimer's. Um, and it turns out that's because the gene for APP, which I've been talking about, is on chromosome 21, and chromosome 21 is the chromosome, it's the smallest human chromosome, it's the chromosome that gets triplicated in uh, Down syndrome. So uh, you make too much APP, it turns out you're gonna get Alzheimer's. And some of the best evidence for this is there are a few people with Down syndrome who have a deletion of the gene for APP in one of those chromosomes. So they don't make too much APP and they don't get Alzheimer's. A question over here. Um, it, is it on? Okay. The good friends um, 
has, has a child with uh, Down syndrome. And um, they've been working diligently to set money aside so that there Hold it a little closer. So there's care for the child when uh, he grows older. Can you tell me, um, I understand that uh, children with Down syndrome live uh, shorter lives. So yeah. at, at what point, uh, and I don't know what that is, but at what point do they get Alzheimer's? I, I could give you another talk on Down syndrome. I, I don't have time for all of that now, but I do have time to answer that particular question. They do live shorter lives. It used to be they would all die in the, uh, the age, sometime their life expectancy was about five years old. Now it's 60. That's a huge change in the last few years. And that's because they now sew up the heart defects on one side. And the other side is they don't put them in institutions. They stay with their families, they go to school, and they just live better lives and live longer. They get Alzheimer's at the end of those lives, usually because that's the end of their life because they have Alzheimer's. So that happens between 40 and 60 years of age, typically. And then there's uh, a couple of families where there's an extra copy of just a short region of chromosome 21 that contains the APP gene, and they do get Alzheimer's. So this is sort of the genetic proof. So A beta is the cause of Alzheimer's. It's the main component of plaque. Plaque accumulates in the brain of people with Alzheimer's. So it's likely that plaque causes the symptoms. Doesn't prove that plaque causes the symptoms. It proves that A beta causes the symptoms, but it doesn't have to be the plaque form. So the best idea that I can present, yeah, question back here. Vein plaque that's vascular plaque and no, this is, no, this is different. It's using the same word as vascular plaque, but this is plaque that is due to the for formation of these uh, fibrils within the brain. So this isn't vascular. Is that your question? Yeah. Okay. So, so the best idea I can present to you is that A beta begins a cascade of changes that result in tau tangles later. The tau tangles kill the nerve cells and that subsequently results in dementia. And this cascade takes years. So I just wanna make the point that interrupting this chain, um, any place in the chain, if you could break the chain, um, A beta wouldn't cause Alzheimer's. Uh, dementia. So it's really important that we successfully identify all of the components of this chain. So I want to talk a minute about APOE because probably most of you have heard of APOE, probably in the form of APOE4. It's a gene that makes a protein that's present in the brain. It's also present in the vascular system. Um, it carries A beta uh, into the neurons. Um, and one form of this gene called E4 or APOE4 is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's. If you have one copy of the APOE4 allele, it's called, of this gene, you have a, about a fourfold increase risk of getting Alzheimer's. You won't get it for sure, but you have a fourfold increase. And uh, E2 version is protective. Um, and mice deleted for APOE can't get Alzheimer's. Even if you give them the human gene, they can't get Alzheimer's because APOE is necessary for formation of plaque in the brain. That's, that's not right. It's not necessary for the formation of plaque. It's necessary for tangles, as I'll show you on this slide. So. There's a family, there, uh, there's a family of, uh, that carries a mutation where all the members of the family who have the mutation um, get Alzheimer's, all of them. 
if you have that mutation, you're doomed to get Alzheimer's, except there was one woman in that family who didn't get it. And they did the test, and she had the mutation that caused Alzheimer's. So why didn't she get um, Alzheimer's? Turns out, she, unlike all the other members of her family, had high plaque, but she didn't get tangles. What was wrong? Why, what was good? What happened that resulted in plaque, plaque not leading to tangles? And the answer was that she had a, another mutation. This was a mutation in APOE. They, it was called Christchurch. This mutation, in, because that's where she lived, uh, this mutation uh, broke the chain. So a mutation in APOE, that, that puts APOE genetically um, here in the chain between A beta and tau. And since we know it carries A beta into neurons, that makes uh, a lot of sense. So I want to talk a minute about something called genome-wide association studies, the, uh, a, a brand new technique or relatively new technique that identifies genes that contribute but don't cause, but contribute to the formation of any particular disease or characteristic. And, and uh, what you do is look at a large population of people and you separate them into, in this case, those that get Alzheimer's and those that don't get Alzheimer's and ask what genes are associated with the ones, the people that get Alzheimer's. This is a very powerful technique that can, can be used to determine what changes are contributing to Alzheimer's or anything else, but in this case, Alzheimer's. You, many different genes have been identified this way and I want to talk about what those genes are, what those genes do. So one thing you can do with this technique is determine how much of the chance of getting Alzheimer's is due to inheritance. It's called heritability. And when you do that, you find that about 85% of Alzheimer's is heritable. You get it from your parents but all in lots of different combinations. So you could have two parents with Alzheimer's and you never get it because you don't get all of the same ones from that, all that they had because you only get half of what each parent had. That's the way it works. So now you've identified all these new proteins. What do you do with that information? So it turns out the best thing to do is to simply look at um, what is known about these genes. What do they do? So many of the proteins are involved in the production, aggregation, or clearing of A beta. So this is, again, more evidence that A beta is, in fact, responsible for Alzheimer's. But others, the other about half of these genes identified by genome-wide association studies, the other half um, are genes that are expressed in a kind of cell in the brain called the microglia. And microglia are immune cells. They're part of your immune system. They're responsible for inflammation. Remember I said at the very beginning that inflammation was part of the cause of Down syndrome. So it's beginning to look like uh, A beta and plaque are necessary but not sufficient for causing Alzheimer's disease. All the genetics points to A beta. Clearly A beta is a cause, but just because it's a cause doesn't mean it's a cause that will always cause the disease. It's causing the disease in some way uh, but there are people with A beta plaques in their brain who do not get dementia. 
but the genetics also po uh, uh, points to microglia as a cause, the brain's immune cells. And it, it seems most likely, to me at least, that an interaction between A beta plaque and the immune system, the immune cells of the brain, uh, probably through inflammation, uh, results in Alzheimer's disease. So A beta is a cause, inflammation is a cause, but maybe you need both to get Alzheimer's. So. Now the fiction part. Um, there's a lot of people who are, are putting this out as fact these days. I cannot find science in favor of most of it. I can find science in favor of exercise. So all of these things on this slide might help with dementia. They're certainly good for you. There's no reason not to engage in social activities that I can think of, most social activities. So mice don't get dementia, they, they just don't. But if you give them the human APP gene, they do. But you put an exercise wheel in their cage and they don't. That's interesting. Mice love to run, by the way. Put an exercise wheel out in the field behind your house, you'll find a mouse running on it. <laughs> That's true. Um, so how does he exercise help? I don't really have time to go into this in any great, great detail, but it probably helps in at least three different ways. Uh, it, it improves blood circulation, that's clearly good. It reduces inflammation, that's clearly good. And uh, it stimulates a, a protein to be made called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, which stimulates the production of new nerve cells. So if your nerve cells are dying, exercise may help you replace them. So exercise is really good for dementia. It's good for everything, but it's really good for dementia. Um, and they have done enough science to know that aerobic exercise is the best kind. So there's a lot of different, uh, I'm, I'm gonna skip this slide because I'm running low on time. But, and I want to get to the last part of this talk um, about finding drugs that prevent dementia. Um, so there's these new monoclonal antibody drugs um, that get, uh, you get by infusion. And so it's, they're very expensive and they're very um, uh, hard to administer. They have to be given to you every two weeks. It, they're, they're, but they're, they've been approved now, some of them have been approved by the FDA for, for dementia. Um, and these are all monoclonal antibodies against A beta. So that provides more, the, the science behind these drugs provides more evidence that A beta is in fact responsible. But there's a, a lot of words of caution with these drugs and I want to get to that. So this is the only real science that I'm going to present today. This is about a new drug that hasn't yet been approved but will be approved called denanumab. And what you can see on this slide, um, on, on the left side, is how incredibly effective denanumab is at getting rid of plaque. Because if you get, if the people who get um, denanumab are down here, they, the, the amount of plaque is way down and these people got control uh, infusions. They didn't lose plaque at all. And, and you can also see on this side that, the, that there's lots of people who got denanumab who have no detectable plaque anymore at all. So does the, is this the cure? Gets rid of plaque? And the answer is, um, it, oh, it also gets rid of uh, tau tangles, by the way. Um, the answer is, shown in this slide, is the people, so this shows memory tests uh, for, for two groups here. And this group got plaque and they have memory loss over the course of this year and a half of, of testing uh, and treatment. And these people got 
uh, denanomab, and they also deteriorated, but not as fast. So they got about six months of extra uh, uh, memory, life with memory. That's all. So for some reason, even though they got rid of all the plaque, it didn't prevent Alzheimer's. And by the way, there's also some very serious side effects that occur in a low, at a low frequency. Um, and so you have to really think hard before you want to do this. So why did they, why did this happen? Why did they lose all the plaque and not prevent, that didn't prevent memory loss? It just slowed it. Uh, here's the most likely explanation. It has to do with this timeline business. Um, the most likely explanation is that by the time you know you're having memory loss, the cat's out of the bag, the horse is out of the barn, et cetera, you, the, the patient already has some cognitive impairment. So otherwise, you don't know to put them in the trial for this drug. Um, the damage has been done. So it's impractical to target plaque on everyone because you don't know who's going to get memory loss. Um, it's not that common a disease. Um, it's, it, and before they show a sign of cognitive impairment, it's impractical. So we need to target molecules further down like tau or APOE um, in order to really do this. So it, it really has to do with the timeline. You're, you're, you're targeting a molecule that is the cause but is at the beginning of the chain and, you, and it's too late. Um, so I just wanna say that I think there's real hope now um, for a cure for Alzheimer's and I don't think it's all that far off. Um, so a key was understanding that Alzheimer's starts 20 years before symptoms show up at all. Um, and that suggests we should test drugs um, at the earliest stages before the brain is damaged. Um, we may be able to detect Alzheimer's even sooner if we can develop a blood test. And a lot of people are working on trying to develop a blood test. It's not so easy to, uh, to do PET scans on a lot of people uh, or spinal taps, which at least aren't as expensive. So the new drugs um, uh, then could be tested if you had, if you had a, a, a knowledge by blood tests. And um, I will stop there. Dr. Blumenthal, Tom. <laughs> so, <laughs> Tom I want fine. to express heartfelt gratitude to you on behalf of the Boulder Rotary Club and everybody present today for your generously sharing your invaluable insights. Your talk not only shed light on the complexities of the Alzheimer's disease, but also contributes to our understanding of how our club might advance uh, President Kurtz's signature initiative and make a contribution to addressing this growing problem in our larger community. So in recognition of your dedication to advancing knowledge in the field of genetics and molecular biology, and as a token for our appreciation for your giving us this excellent talk today, we'd like to contribute 100 doses of polio vaccine to the Polio Plus initiative that Rotary has had in its long-standing effort to uh, eliminate this dread disease from the planet Earth. So thank you once again for your great talk. Thank you, Gary. And as Janet said earlier, um, I met with the committee one time, and I'm happy to meet with the committee as many times as they like whenever they're having meetings. Um, 
uh, uh, because I would love to see this succeed. I, I don't expect it's going to be a contribution to the kind of science I talked about today because that's terribly expensive. But there are so many needs in the community of, of people care, caregiving uh, uh, someone with Alzheimer's. And I'm, I'm really glad that Rotary is doing this. And I will contribute in any way I can. Suicide is still the leading cause of death for adolescents in the U.S. After the club meeting on December 1st from 1.45 to 3.30 p.m., our Mental Wellness Committee will sponsor a suicide prevention awareness discussion at the Boulder JCC. Please join us to learn about strategies to help combat this issue. Hey, Boulder Rotary, are you ready for an even better Tuesday in November? Giving Tuesday is coming, November 28th. You are all about service above self. This is a great opportunity to join with others around the world to support causes you believe in. One of the best ways to make a difference is through giving to the Rotary Foundation. Why? Because all over the world, Rotary Foundation is making projects happen in peace building. Disease prevention. Water, sanitation, hygiene, mother and child health, education and literacy, economic development, and the environment. It is so easy. Go to You can learn more about Giving Tuesday here. Oh my gosh, these guys are so ready for Giving Tuesday. Oh, it's so great here in Lisbon, sitting on a park bench on a beautiful day. But who's this? <gasps> Chad. Chad. It's Yanni and Maria. What are you guys doing here? We've been looking all over uh, this this the city for you. What do you think of the city? We love it. So while we're here, let's do a Rotarian on the street. Okay, we are outside the world famous Time Out Market here in Lisbon. Yes. So here is today's question. At what time did time begin? When the Portuguese uh, discovered the world. When the Portuguese discovered the world. Maria? What time, was, what time was it when time began? I would agree. However, I don't remember the year. I would say... <laughs> and they, did they go west or did they go east <laughs> to discover the world? Based on my experience of being inside the timeout market, it's always happy hour. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> and we always celebrate happy hour together Cheers too. from Lisbon. Saúl from Lisboa.
State Representative Judy Amabile is coming to Boulder Rotary next week to talk about the mental health crisis in our community, which is interconnected with homelessness and public safety. Representative Amabile has personal experience trying to help her son through mental health crisis and longer term treatment. She'll talk about the need for providing round the clock access to support for people in crisis, a shortage of providers, and the adequacy of the mental health network. She's been working to explore lessons from other communities and how Boulder is responding with mobile response teams and a new crisis center. Shout it really loud. Have a great weekend.